Arvind, thank you for uh, spending this time talking to us here at CNBC about your announcements out of uh, IBM Think, and then specifically AI, uh, Watson X. Um, you've got AI data and governance. What does this really offer that's different to the enterprise software ecosystem right now? Yeah. So, John. Thank you for asking about this. And it's so exciting to be here at Think. Uh, somewhere between four and 5,000 people, super exciting, and all excited to hear about our AI announcements. So just to give you a little bit of background, there's a lot of attention and excitement, correctly, I believe, in the world about the, cap the capability of large language models and generative AI. Our, our excitement is not about what it can do for the consumer, which it can, and we're excited about that also for all those who do that, but about what it can do for the enterprise. And when I say the enterprise, I mean what people can do inside the enterprise, in regulated enterprises, and also where accuracy, scaling, and governance are important. So to, to give you a sense of what it can do, imagine taking some of your HR processes, inside an enterprise and being able to really leverage AI to automate it, whether it's onboarding, whether it's promotions, whether it's compensation decisions, and do it in such a way that it meets exactly the protocols and the regulations that you want for yourself. Or maybe for people to help write code, but in the exact way, meet the password standards that your enterprise has set meet the onboarding of a user to an application that you have set. Hmm. And as you go further, imagine compliance, audit, all these processes that make up an enterprise, being able to leverage AI to make them that much better. And the generative piece is when you get to things like code writing, when you get to things like making decisions, and that is why it's so exciting. Okay. But do it in the privacy of an enterprise using their own data. Right, I know you're, you're allowing people to do it on premise or in the cloud, but take a, take a step back for me here. It's 2023, you've been in the CEO seat just since around the beginning of the pandemic, but IBM has been talking about AI in one form or another for a long time. I mean, 25 years ago, it was chess. A decade, 15 years ago, it was Watson. Why are we talking about open AI now as driving the conversation around AI and not Watson? And how is your approach this time going to change that for this next era? Yeah, so uh, a great question, John. And I think very, it's very much about some technologies take a time to mature. And I think to give OpenAI credit, they've achieved for AI kind of what Netscape achieved for the internet. By the way, the internet was more than a dozen years old when Netscape came along, but they really helped put it into perspective for the business leaders, for CEOs. It really inspired them to think about what the internet could do for business. I think OpenAI did exactly that. Now, if we think about the evolution of AI, the, the ones you're mentioning, machine learning, I would say that was maybe the deep blue era. If I look at Watson winning Jeopardy, that was the deep learning era. Very good AI, really useful, but still the burden to get it implemented was high. You had to get labeled data, experts built a model, and after six months of work, you could deploy a model. But that's a lot of work and a lot of expense for one task. With this approach of foundation models, you really build the model once, but then you can get 100 tasks done, each one over a weekend, not necessarily with experts. So when you get a 100x improvement in the possibility of deploying AI for a business advantage, that seems pretty revolutionary. And that is why I believe this time the adoption is really going to take off because we have met the hurdles of both uh, the cost of a single model as well as of how to get it deployed. That's a pretty big deal, I think. Uh, talk to me about how uh, IBM creates an advantage for itself here in the marketplace. Talking to Satya Nadella over at Microsoft, he's talking about combining the infrastructure with Azure along with uh, you know, search and some of the applications work that they're trying to do, different layers, different lines of attack to try to uh, take their cloud momentum into the AI era. How is IBM's hybrid approach potentially going to create advantages for you here when you've got these large hyperscaler players that are also trying to dominate? Look, I think the hyperscaler players will get their successes and uh, with, with uh, a lot of respect for what uh, Satya is doing over at Microsoft, with what OpenAI is doing, actually also with what Google is doing and talking about, there is going to be an approach that succeeds there. 
But similar to how Red Hat succeeds in a hybrid cloud approach, in addition to what people succeed with in public clouds, there are lots of people who are going to worry about the data going anywhere. If I think about audit, you think about compliance, you think about places where they need extreme accuracy, where they need to make sure that the model has only been fed with data that they trust. It has no data from sources that they cannot point to the lineage to. There is an opportunity for us in those enterprises. So giving people the ability, they can decide to deploy it on their own premises, they can deploy it on their their private cloud, they can deploy it in their own dedicated instance on top of Azure and AWS, gives them a deployment option they don't really have with some of the other approaches. Two, okay. we're also going to partner. We had a partnership with Hugging Face. So you can start with models IBM gives you, you can bring in open source models, and by the way, you can train your own model, not just the ones that are the, at the basis of what OpenAI or Microsoft or IBM gives you. I think this does give people a lot of flexibility in how they deploy, and they can meet all the conditions that the enterprise wants as well. Okay. Uh, a few days ago, you announced, I believe, that IBM is freezing hiring in thousands of positions that you think AI is going to potentially make obsolete in the pretty near term. How quickly might we move from AI affecting hiring freezes to AI making uh, actual existing jobs obsolete? And IBM has a lot of employees. There's a big risk there if you've got to cut uh, pretty soon over time because AI is, is sapping the potential productivity of that workforce. Yeah, so, so John, th those media reports covered half of what I said, but not all. Okay. I, I do believe that AI is going to replace a lot of what I'm calling white collar clerical jobs. So the, the ones that are much more repetitive, the ones where people do the same task again and again and again, I think a good 30% of those roles could go away over five years. By the way, when you think about 30% over five years, that's actually handled by attrition. That's why I called it, we're not going to backfill those roles. However, at the same time, it's going to create lots of other roles, more roles around AI prompt engineers, more roles around software engineering. As technology becomes more and more competitive, as a source of competitive advantage, companies are going to need to hire more people into those jobs. So I think that the value creating jobs are going to increase, and I believe our total employment will increase, while there will be a reduction in more of those back office roles. I think that's actually goodness. Look. We can take the nature of farming. 1900, 40% of the US population was directly working on farms. Today it's 3%. The other 37% have plenty of jobs. The nature of roles tends to change. If I follow the US census, 60% of all jobs changed between 1940 and today. I think this is just the next uh, era of those kinds of changes. And generally the jobs become better, not worse, as time goes on. Well, let's hope and, and, and let's broaden out to, to look at the macro environment right now, specifically when it comes to government. Uh, you have a big government client base, including in the U.S., and right now we are potentially running up against the debt ceiling deadline that would affect not just uh, government spending, but all markets, the, the whole economy. How are you looking at that as a uh, business risk, a business impact here in 2023? Look, I am always a believer that people should hopefully see a rational outcome while they're still negotiating. Look, that's a political process, and I'm no expert on the political process. But I do believe that I, I am reasonably confident that they will get it resolved. The question is when. Will it be right before, right during, right after? And, and it, it will have an impact. It has an impact on the confidence on currency as well as on the economy. But. My, my base scenario will be it'll get resolved in a way that there may be some kind of short-term um, cycle, but nothing that is impactful even for the quarter. And that's where I do hope that they get to. I think anything else is, uh, is not worth really considering because it could be, it could be much more dire. Okay, uh, echoing what Janet Yellen told us yesterday a little bit there, though she used language that was a bit more uh, extreme. She was talking about chaos. Um, let me ask you about the impact thus far of the regional bank turmoil for uh, medium-sized business customers, certainly, who, who uh, might be looking for IBM services. Are you seeing a change in confidence 
or purchasing behavior? Are you needing to lean more on your own financing capabilities to fill in gaps there? Uh, John, the data so far does not show us any of that. If I look at the data, the confidence in business software, the confidence in deploying uh, technology remains high. Now, but I don't want to be naive. I think that as the credit uh, tightening will happen, it will likely impact medium businesses. Those are not usually our direct customers, are not really very large customers. However, they are the customers of our customers. So I do expect that we'll see a second order effect as the year wears on. But this is going to be a slow, not a, not a quick uh, tightening. And so whether it's at the very end of the year or early next year, I would expect there could be a small impact on us. And then finally, the, the free cash flow target that you've given um, is, is important to a lot of investors, but also has some people scratching their heads about, uh, given the, the chaotic environment, how confident you can be in it. Uh, what, what is inspiring your confidence in those free cash flow results by end of year at this point? Well, uh, you mentioned one of the beginning. As we are leveraging AI ourselves to become more productive, that is one piece which impacts us. Two, we see pretty strong demand for all of our technology offerings. So that's the second piece that uh, impacts it. And three, always when we look at our revenue, I do believe that while there could be a little bit of softening, and we said that in April, it's not significant on the top line. We're pretty comfortable on the bottom line. And we saw that in the first quarter results as well. And that is what gives us confidence in meeting our free cash flow targets of 10.5 billion. All right, Arvind Krishna, CEO of IBM. I appreciate you joining us. Always good time.